<sighs> Lex, are you sure I should make this video? What I think is immaterial, Master Omniviewer. The fact of the matter is that it must be done. If you fear that you have been too one-sided in this discussion, clarification is in order. Yeah, but I usually try not to get political on my channel. I guess I've been keeping it pent up for a while, but what if this goes over poorly? Omniviewer, um, you are making that video. If you do not make it, then you shall regret it. Perhaps not today, and perhaps not tomorrow, but soon, and for the rest of your life. Yeah, I guess you're right. I mean, it's not like I'm doing this video to attack anyone. If anything, I'm doing it to bring people together. All right, you've convinced me. Once more into the breach. That's better. You may recall that my review of The Bandwagon also made a case for escapism in entertainment, since it's a film that revels in being silly and pointless while simultaneously pointing out how trying to insert deeper meaning into everything can potentially lead to disaster. Yeah, but people have been asking about the other side of that argument. There are classic movies out there that are steeped in politics, after all. Which begs the question of what makes the classics different from modern movies which do the same. There are some blanket statements I can make to express that difference, like how modern movies convey their politics in a way that condescends to the audience, or how controversy is forcibly attached to the work when it has no place being there to begin with. Then again, there are enough people out there who are tearing down modern cinema in this fashion. My method, therefore, will be to elevate an example of a film that does things right. And as luck would have it, it's also considered one of the greatest movies of all time. I speak, naturally, of Casablanca. When you look at Casablanca from a thematic standpoint, it becomes apparent that the movie is about World War II. It's not just set during the war, but is a proper allegory for America's entrance into it. Think about it. Every major character in the film represents a nation that was involved in the conflict. Rick, with his staunch neutrality and running of a multicultural establishment, is America. Captain Reno, who is attempting to maintain some level of authority under the ever-watchful eye of the Germans, represents occupied France. Major Strasser, being a Nazi, obviously represents Nazi Germany. Ilse Lund and Victor Laszlo, the underdog freedom fighters, represent the European resistance from nations which Germany has claimed as its own. One of the most iconic scenes in the film involves German soldiers singing a patriotic German song only for their ditty to be drowned out when Laszlo leads the crowd in singing the French national anthem, ending with cries of Viva la France from a side character. The outcome of the plot, that is, whether the resistance or the Nazis win, depends on the involvement of Rick the American, who has a history of interfering with foreign conflicts but who outwardly proclaims neutrality. And just in case you still doubt the presence of a metaphor, consider when the film takes place. It was released in 1943, but set in... Well, I'll let Bogey tell you. It's December 1941 in Casablanca. What time is it in New York? That's right. December 1941. Which, if you even have a basic knowledge of world history, is also when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, thus drawing America into the conflict. Now yes, I know there aren't any Japanese characters in the film, though Peter Lorre did play one in an Invisible Man sequel, but that choice of date is difficult to write off as coincidence, especially when placed alongside all of the other stuff I mentioned. Basically, when you take all of these elements into account and remember the context in which this film was made, it's obvious that Casablanca has a very strong political undercurrent to it. The film is undeniably rooted in the age it was made, and so you can imagine people who saw it back then likely picked up on these themes, whether they consciously realized it or not. The message is clearly that America is vital to winning the war, Uncle Sam wants you, bye bye, bye bonds, USA, USA. There's no getting around it, folks. Casablanca is a very politically charged piece of cinema. This, of course, is why Casablanca has aged so poorly. It is considered a cultural artifact, a product of its time that simply cannot be enjoyed in the modern day. Omni, they know you're being sarcastic. Casablanca is ranked as one of the greatest films ever made, and it's aged better than most movies from 1943. It has indeed, Snazzy, and that begs the question of how it managed to do it. 
The answer is something that used to be standard practice in entertainment. And if common sense prevails, it will be again. I've stated this various times in the past, and I'll continue to say it until I no longer need to. Story should always be the priority over soapboxing. When I say story, I mean all of the elements that make good entertainment, such as plot, characters, world building, dialogue, and anything that's medium specific like cinematography or audio mixing. You can include commentary in your story, indeed having commentary can elevate a work if executed well, but prioritizing it above all else is a mistake. Politics are best delivered as subtext, something for the audience to discover for themselves. When the subtext becomes the main text, that means you're getting things backwards. Let me put it this way. You can't live in a house where the living room is pristine, but every other room is in disrepair. Or maybe, politics is not the meat of art, story is the meat, and politics is the seasoning, which you don't want too much of, but... Snazzy, I'm struggling to find a metaphor here. So don't bother with it and just cut to the chase. Good idea. Look, politics are a very timely subject matter, and as such, they are destined to fall out of fashion eventually. Art is not sustained by what makes it timely, but rather by what makes it timeless. And the timeless elements can only be found in the story. And how do you know if a story has what it takes to be timeless? Easy. Your story has a better chance at being timeless if it can sustain itself without the politics. Let's go back to Casablanca and I'll show you what I mean. I opened this dissertation by speaking about how Casablanca can easily be interpreted as an allegory for the United States entering World War II, and given that it was made in the thick of the conflict, there was almost certainly an unspoken message about supporting the war effort to go with it. Ah, but here's the twist. That's not what Casablanca is really about. When you remove the politics, what you're left with is still a gripping and powerful story. Casablanca is not really about nations in conflict, but about people in the midst of conflict. It's a story about individuals who are each trying to escape their pasts to reach a better future. It's a love story where the lovers don't wind up together because they realize they never can be. These threads all exist independently of the political subtext. Heck, this is even true for each individual character we see. For the best example, and just to keep this little speech focused, let's zero in on our main character, Rick. As already stated, Rick can be viewed as a representation of the United States, but when you take that away, he remains a proper character. Rick is not just America personified. Rick is a man haunted by his past. He is a man who is naturally compassionate and altruistic, but since he's been hurt so often by acting on those feelings, he's conditioned himself to suppress them for as long as possible. Perhaps most vitally to the plot, he is a man torn between two choices. Either do something selfish that gratifies only him but leads to others suffering, or do something selfless that others will benefit from even though he'll be left with nothing. Now yes, these elements are enhanced when the allegory is added but they remain fully functional without it. In short, Casablanca functions as a compelling work of fiction first and foremost, and while the political subtext is present and can enrich the experience, it does not interfere with the story. People who did not grow up in the climate of 1940s America can watch it and love it for that very reason. The model presented here is one that all entertainers would be wise to follow. Unfortunately, these past few years have seen an influx of art that has its priorities all screwed up. The commentaries are no longer the subtext, but are instead repurposed as the main text. If you try removing the politics from one of these works, at the best it's unremarkable and average, and at the worst it's, well, the worst. By choosing to be entrenched in the political atmosphere of today, they've sacrificed their relevancy for tomorrow. Granted, we don't know it for certain yet, but I think it's a long shot to claim the last few years of the 2010s have produced anything of the same caliber as Casablanca. Maybe there are a few that could make it, but they've got quite a few hurdles to overcome first. So to put a cap on this whole thing, I'm not opposed to the idea of politics and fiction on principle. I in fact understand how the inclusion of politics can enhance certain artistic experiences. 
But that being said, I do believe there is a right way and a wrong way when it comes to inserting politics. As exemplified by Casablanca, the right way is to have it be subtext that enhances the story without overpowering it. When it's no longer subtext and it supersedes the story to the point where everything else is neglected, or if the story can't survive without that element, that's when you have a problem. Casablanca is considered a classic for a reason. My advice? Try to be like Casablanca. Until such time as we meet again, this is the Omni Viewer signing off. He's a fine lad, but he needs encouragement every now and then. Best back to the airship. I am double parked after all. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like it as well as subscribe to the channel for more content of a similar nature. Also, check the description for links to our Twitter, DeviantArt, and Patreon pages, as well as the Amazon link for the novel Operation Red Dragon The Daikaiju Wars Part 1, penned by yours truly. Thank you all, and we appreciate your support.